Super. Fantastic. So here we are. We're on week three of Joint School Live. And Brogan, it's fantastic to have you back. I will unpin myself so that we can we can share the screen. Um, let's see. There we are. Now we're side by side again. We're back right. where we were last week. And it feels like we're, we're in a good position to do a natural continuation of, uh, of where we were last week, uh, in which we covered some, a, a bit of a general overview, but I hope people find it useful. And indeed, I've heard we've had some great feedback on it. So, so I think people did find it useful uh, in terms of giving a bit of a general overview of, of arthritis and a few of the steps that may help people to manage the symptoms and problems that that can cause, um, especially in these rather strange and uncertain times. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, so, so the, thanks for joining us again, Brogan. And, um, and uh, as, as we, we, we touched on last week, uh, we went over um, your role as a, as a physician associate, which means that you know, in normal circumstances, your day-to-day -day is working very closely with uh, Professor Cobb um, mm -hmm. and you know, lo looking after people who are getting ready for hip and knee replacements and also who are recovering from, from these procedures and a lot of things around that. <laughs> exactly. But indeed, what, what that means is that you are very well placed to help give an idea of the kind of questions that people often ask, uh, be it when they are getting ready for these, for these procedures and the kind of things that you might, you might think about. Um, and, and, you know, we're, we're, we're all well aware that, um, awaiting these procedures can be daunting and, and there are uncertainties and, 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 and likely to be many unanswered questions at the best of times and perhaps more so now. So hopefully we'll be able to provide some reassurance uh, and address some of those questions. And again, as we've flagged before, of course, nothing we're saying here is medical advice and should not replace anything that anyone will hear from their specific surgeon or anyone in their team, their doctor, GP and so on. But the aim is to provide some useful overarching advice, some top tips, um, and hopefully some reassurance within that. Mm -hmm. Great. Super. Well, so, so I think so, so in, before this, we, we, we just touched base on, on some of the common questions. And I think one that often arises and, uh, that, that you highlighted is just how long, how, how, how long will I need to be in hospital after a knee replacement or after a hip replacement? Yeah, yeah. So usually when I uh, talk to patients before surgery, this is one of the most common questions they ask is, is how long should they prepare to be in hospital? And like most things, it does vary between patients, but typically we're looking at between two to four nights. Um, so the key to discharge is really safety. And most of that's working with physio and occupational therapy. So once patients are safe mobilizing, so typically with a frame or with crutches, uh, they need to be eating and drinking, able to use the toilet on their own, their pain needs to be well controlled and really they need to be safe getting around their home. So into and out of bed and up and downstairs if needed. So once those things happen, patients tend to be safe to go home. Obviously younger, healthier patients are discharged quicker. And if there's any complications to the surgery or if there's any side effects of medications, those patients tend to be discharged later. But on average, we're looking at two to four nights. Okay, okay. So it can vary a bit and it'll depend largely on Sort of home circumstances, level of support at home, stairs at home. Yeah, um, yeah. And how, and if some patients have used crutches before, if you use support systems, um, they may find it easier to learn to go up and down stairs on those devices, um, and that can sometimes seed the process. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's perhaps worth mentioning, we, we touched a little bit, I think, last week on um, uh, enhanced recovery um, mm -hmm. protocols, which, which some people may come across, and generally this move towards uh, getting people up up and about as 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 soon as you can really, which which I think is becoming uh, a, f a fairly common practice. Uh, but within that, I think you know in the in the past in the past few years and certainly the past decade, the no the number of nights and days spent in hospital after these operations has has been brought down significantly. Yeah, yeah, and we don't want to keep patients in hospital longer than they need to be, and they don't want to stay either. So as soon as they're safe to go home, um, that's when we want to discharge them, yeah, get absolutely. them back into their environments. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and there's a lot to support the idea that the, the best place to be when recovering is at home, familiar mm -hmm. environment, you know, friends and family support, and, 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 you know, and, and avoiding all the, all the annoying beeps and things and other stuff mm -hmm. going on in hospitals, and not to mention 
you know, risk for infection and bugs and things like that. So it's absolutely the best thing to be at home. And I guess it's also worth mentioning, uh, as, as people may well come across it, the idea of day case procedures or having an operation and, and going home the same day, which is also becoming a, 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 bit, more, a bit more common. Uh, and maybe something that people will find that they uh, are offered or that they discuss with their surgical team. Um, but, 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 that, but that very much depends on you know, the suitability of the person for that procedure and, and many other factors. Yeah, and it'll still be the same. So um, those patients will tend to have surgery very early in the morning, and then they still have to prove that they're, you know, they meet those safety checks of of being able to mobilize, being able to eat and drink, and to use the toilet on their own. And um, and you're right, it's becoming more and more common um, to do that. Yeah, okay. Uh, and then if we move on to sort of w w when you're getting ready to to go home, because I think one one thing that that is especially with 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 this move towards spending. Uh, fewer days in hospital. Uh, people can sometimes may sometimes feel that they're leaving the hospital or, or or the surgical unit still with some unanswered questions, or that questions may arise soon thereafter. And so, I guess an another common question is, you know, what what is the follow up like? When will I be seen again? Yeah, yeah. So um, typically, most uh, hospital trusts have a six week follow up policy where they'll see patients six weeks post op. Um, at that visit, typically an x ray is checked so we can look at the inside, make sure everything is where it's supposed to be. Uh, and sometimes the wound or the scar will be reviewed at that time too. Um, that's most typical right now in these um, times. That may not happen. And so many visits right now are becoming remote post op visits where um, you could speak either video or phone and an x-ray may only be taken if there's concern um, so a lot of times if patients are feeling clinically well um, they don't have any pain and, and they're improving then the x-rays may be not necessarily needed at least now when we're trying to keep as many patients out of the hospital as possible okay. Okay. Um, and generally speaking what what type of medications would, would people be be given to take with them as when they leave after surgery yeah, so after discharge, uh, there's two main medications that are given to almost all patients. Um, the first one is pain control. So um, it's really important that patients' pain is under control both in the hospital and then when they go home. So the majority of patients are taking paracetamol um, if they're able to, if there's no reason that they shouldn't be. Um, and maybe something a little stronger for pain if needed, but usually for a very short time. So paracetamol tends to be the mainstay pain medication. Um, the second medication is a blood thinner. So a medication that patients may have heard of is something like a Pixaban or even aspirin. And these medications help prevent clots from forming in the blood. So when you have surgery on large joints and also when patients are a little more inactive after surgery, both of these things put patients at a greater risk of developing blood clots. So what we need to do is give a medication that thins the blood and, and decreases these risks. So typically those medications are in place for about a month. Um, and those are the big ones. There may be others that patients are discharged, but really it's about pain control and preventing clots post-op. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course it's worth highlighting that pain control uh, protocols and what you're given is likely to vary um, mm -hmm. from hospital to hospital, perhaps even surgeon to surgeon, and certainly country to country. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and there's a lot of ways to, to, to manage pain. There's a lot of different medications and there's a lot of different names, so different brand names. So paracetamol in the US is, I'll uh, 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 ask you to. <laughs> is is you, acetaminophen or Tylenol? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just in case for, for, for any American uh, viewers out yes, there, but mine yes. is paracetamol. Uh, and similarly with, with the blood thinners, there's a really wide, there's quite a wide range of alternatives. Yeah, so, yeah, they can vary from being pills that you take to injections that you need to give themselves. Um, but what's important is that if you need to take those, that you take them for the full amount of time. Yeah, yeah. And other uh, other steps that that uh, that uh, people may be encouraged to to take or things to do after surgery also to reduce the risk of blood clots may be to wear uh, these compression stockings or or head stockings where the Yes, yes. And no one likes them. Um, they're not no, easy no. to put on. They're not <laughs> easy to take off. But um, in general, they also do decrease the risk of blood clots at thought. So um, 
typically after surgery, patients will wake up and they'll have the stockings on and then need to wear them for a few weeks, depending on what their surgeon or what the trust recommends. Yeah, exactly. And, and that will also be a sort of a, a protocol that each surgeon, each hospital will, will have as a, as, as a set time period for, mm-hmm. for keeping up with these, with these annoying, <laughs> with these annoying socks. But, yeah. but, but they, but they, 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 they have a role to play and the, Ted stocking, as someone, as, as as some some may know them as, that's the the TED stands for thromboembolic deterrence. So the idea that they help to, you know, squeeze so squeeze the bottom of the, the bottom of the legs together and and, and prevent blood kind of pooling and, and reduce the risk of, of clots. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, and and they do work. So uh, generally speaking, they they can be annoying, but it's best to sit, stick with them for as long as you've been advised to. Great. Um, uh, okay, and so yeah, so apart from medications, um, the, uh, the, there there may be other things that that uh, other other pieces of kit or other tools or, or or things to have at hand that may help in those particularly in those first few days or perhaps um, potentially even weeks after surgery. What, what what kind of things do people ask about? What kind of things have you, have you heard that people find helpful to have after surgery? Yeah, so when preparing for surgery, I always tell patients to, to assume that they'll want to do as little as possible in their first week or more at home. So really for the first seven to 10 days, just assume that you won't want to do much other than rest. And so for many patients, this means having plans in place for meals um, that are either ready made or frozen or having someone around that can help do the cooking. Um, If they have stairs in their home, make the assumption that you won't want to go up and down the stairs many times through the day. So finding a way to minimize this. So maybe um, if the bedroom is upstairs, you know, you only go up for sleep and then return to the living space and stay there. So finding a way to minimize stress on the joint and, and walking around too much really. So there are some devices around the house that can help. Um, maybe having a toilet seat razor, um, a grabber, some device to help pick things off from the ground. A shoehorn is really useful. Um, those type of things can help just um, aid in recovery. Um, sometimes grab bars around the house will be recommended. Um, and if there's if you need help getting in and out of the shower, you need to think about how you'll be able to do that, sometimes with a seat or sometimes with grab bars. A lot of times trusts will give a uh, checklist of some things to think about before surgery um, that you may want to consider. Yeah, absolutely. And for, for those out there who are using the, the, the Joint School app, uh, you, you'll, you'll similarly find some, uh, some articles and information about things that can be useful to have around the house um, the, the, in, in the app as well. Uh, and, and perhaps what we could do is in the description here beneath this video, we could list some of your t- top, t- top tips for things that you found um, that, that, that people have found helpful. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, and, and I know also that, um, and, and we mentioned this last week with, with Helen, because she raised uh, the, uh, the, 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 the topic of these, these things that can be useful. Um, mm-hmm. And they're, they're, they, they can be found available online as well. You may get them from, from the hospital or trust. Uh, and there's also charities that, that may be able to lend them or sort of rent them for free and, and things like that. I know in many places that the Red Cross have a lot of, a lot of these useful tools available to borrow for free for a period of time. Um, Love it. Super. Um, and then I guess perhaps one of the, the, the big questions that, that, that people will, will ask is how long does it take to recover? How long till I'm able to do the things I want to be doing yeah. after a hip or knee replacement? Exactly. And I think, um, and that's the goal, you know, our goal when patients have surgeries um, is to get them back to activities they love as quickly as possible. Um, And so like all things, it does vary a lot between patients. Um, Most patients really need at least six weeks of slow recovery. So um, we ask most patients to take it easy for about six weeks. So in that time, just doing exercises that they've been given at the hospital from the physio and just walking. Um, In those six weeks, it's important not to push themselves too hard and try to be really gentle on the joint. So um, during that time, there's probably some guidance that you'll be given um, about range of motions that are allowed or not allowed, especially after hip surgery. Um, You know, you often hear that the knee can't be brought up higher than the hip, so that 90 degree roll. So that's important in the first six weeks. Um, But what's most important to remember is that um, your body has undergone a major trauma, so a major surgery, and the bones and the muscles and the skin and all of the soft tissues need to heal. So um, typically we tell people the gentler they can be for the first six weeks, the better, other than doing their exercises. So um, 
after that point, then it becomes, you know, slowly returning to activities that they like um, and things that don't hurt their joint. But the, the six weeks is really the, you know, the crucial healing time where yeah. you won't be doing those activities that you love to do. Yeah. And, and, and I know from, from speaking with, with surgeons who use the My Recovery app is actually about what, what they find quite often and perhaps more so with, with hip replacements or knee replacements. I don't know. If, I haven't read any studies on that, but perhaps that there's actually more of a slight concern about some people who may end up doing too much too soon, particularly in, 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 the, in those first few weeks. Yeah. So I um, speak to lots of patients post up and I very rarely, maybe never tell patients that they're doing too little. So I very often am telling people that they're just doing too much too early on. And especially um, post-op when your pain feels really different and maybe feels better than the pain they've been having for years, the, um, you know, the default is, you know, no pain, no gain and to push themselves. And, and I find that sometimes it's just easier to take it easy and to allow that healing to happen. And then after six weeks is when you can start to to push yeah. those things. Um, and you don't want to have a setback by, you know, either pulling muscles or by increasing the pain or unable to sleep at night because of the pain. So um, my advice is typically to pull back instead of doing more. And, but, but finding that balance also, so sort of little and often little, you know, gentle movements, mm -hmm. keeping ankles and feet moving when resting and perhaps elevating them and all these little things, but not going sort of whole hog into oh, right. back, you know. it is but, it's a hard yeah. balance it is a hard balance and and i do find um you know the balance most patients are, are on the overdoing it side rather than the mm. the under you know by no means do i want patients on bed rest for six weeks but yeah. i also don't want them um you know out walking marathon distances and carrying things and you know gardening and yeah, yeah, yeah. you know lifting weights these type of things in the first six weeks yeah, and so it's six weeks is almost like a, a bit of a magic number, I guess, in, in orthopedics. You know, mo 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 most things tend to get a bit better within six weeks, and it's often a sort of a, a window within which uh, a, a good amount of, uh, of certainly early, early healing can take place. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess indeed the real, the, you know, to see the full benefits of, of a knee and hip replacement, it can take you know, the, 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 that can carry on for, for quite some time. Yeah, yeah. We find that um, patients get a lot of improvement in the six, first six months, but also in the second six months too. So in the, the first six months, you know, certainly the pain and the range of motion improves. And then in the second six months, the strength comes back. And, you know, really by year post-op, um, many patients are getting to the point where they're forgetting which hip is the bad hip. And, and that's the goal. Yeah. So I love seeing patients at, at 12 months post-op when, um, you know, we say something like stand on your good leg and, and they kind of question which one is the good one and so yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the goal is that by 12 months um both legs feel equal or even the operated one feels stronger but it does it does take time and and you know by no means is the healing over at six weeks um, yeah, yeah. so really looking at it as a long a long recovery and a long healing process and and i guess there in to, f further down the line so to speak when 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 people have pro progressed some distance with their recovery and they've got they've got miles on their on their new new hips and knees that's where you know keep, uh, regular activity and you know and, and ch checking in with a physiotherapist to have a personalized plan to help you get back to 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 your key activities that's where that's really that really starts to make a difference i guess Exactly, exactly. Getting the strength back. Um, because oftentimes, if you've had an arthritic hip for years, you lose a lot of the strength that was in those in those muscles, um, and maybe lose a lot of range of motion that used to be there. And so, um, you know, getting back into those routines with the physio is it can be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I've seen some studies coming out of, uh, of the MSK lab, where, 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 where you're involved with where patients have had improvements even at two years or, or perhaps even further down the line than that? Just... Yeah, yeah. And we like to, you know, we walk in our lab, we walk patients on our treadmill to look at their gait and how they walk. And, um, you know, we look at that over years and, and see how that changes. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so it's, again, it's about just keep, keep, keeping up the good work with, the, with, with exercise and activity, listening to the body, listening to your knee, your new knee and new hip, and hopefully even forgetting about which one is... Yes. <laughs> is the, the bad one, so to speak. And, and indeed, that's where things like the, the app can help to keep track of exercises and to keep you motivated to, uh, or, or for, for finding a sort of recovery buddy that can, you know, you, that you can do exercises with or that knows uh, about the, the sort of journey that you're on and you can check in with them and so on. And, and of course, also working closely with a, with a physiotherapist can, can be really helpful as well. Mm -hmm. um, and 
Now, later today, we'll be checking in with uh, Helen Alsop again, um, who will be take, uh, guiding us through it or the, taking us through a set of exercises that are more specifically for people with quite severe knee arthritis or people who are relatively early in their recovery from, um, from a knee replacement. So more on that to come. <laughs> Super. Now, and I guess a related question to, uh, to, to recovery and, and how long recovery takes is, but is uh, how, long it, how long roughly it might take to get back to work or other sort of regular activities and, and, and commitments. Yeah, yeah. So um, it certainly depends on what type of work patients do. So many patients can return to work within two weeks if they have a desk job or they can work from home. Um, and most of us are working from home now, which <laughs> may be for a while. Um, but for manual labor jobs or where you're using your body, um, you know, that six weeks, it tends to be the magic number for something like that. Um, I also tell patients to think about how they get to work. So um, how they do their commute. So for many patients in, in London, in the city, um, they may be commuting during peak hours or riding public transportation. And, you know, those are things that you may want to avoid if you're returning before six weeks. So, you know, traveling at off hours, not using public transportation, minimizing the amount of distances you need to walk, thinking about going up and downstairs. Um, and so if you do go back before six weeks, lots of patients like to go back um, maybe for reduced hours or um, changing their routine a bit so that um, they don't have to work a full day because it can be really exhausting. Like I said, mm -hmm. your body has undergone a trauma. And so, um, you know, expecting to return fully back to work mentally and physically, I think um, it will take some time. Yeah. yeah. And, and, th and this is not a question that we, that, that we discussed a bit, a bit before this, but something related to that, I guess, is around driving. So if, if mm -hmm. you're someone who, who has to drive yourself to work, and of course that, that will be a factor. And indeed, when people can get back to driving, I guess, is, is, is potentially another, another key question around that. Yeah, yeah. And so it depends, um, you know, if you drive a manual car, um, it depends what leg was operated on and it depends what medications you take. So certainly um, you can't return to driving if you're taking any strong pain medication or anything that has um, sedative or sleepy effects. Um, and then it depends on the operated leg. So mostly um, with automatic cars, we tell patients um, they need to be comfortable making a full stop. Mm -hmm. So definitely not before two weeks. Um, and most surgeons um, will recommend somewhere between two and six weeks before returning back to driving. Yeah. But, but again, that's very individual and, and certainly worthwhile checking in with your, with your surgeon. Yes. In the times, they should be able to advise on that. If someone is thinking about, you know, will I be ready to go back and... I guess most, most people are kind of off the roads now anyway. But, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So um, certainly it's good to ask um, the surgeon so that um, for insurance reasons, you've had permission to return to driving. So mm -hmm. it's always something to check before you get back into it, but expect somewhere between two and six weeks. Yeah. And, and that's a good point. It may, it, may, it may be worthwhile checking in with, with the, the insurance company as well about that, because in, in some cases they may have certain rules for certain operations for periods of time as well. Exactly, you just want to make sure you're covered. Yeah, yeah super. Um, okay, well, I, th I think that, that's a pretty good, good overview. Uh, for those who, uh, who are in the situation where the other side is problematic as well, um, you know, they, 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 they might be, you know, or, or, or even those who, who, who don't necessarily have that as yet, but like, is there a sense that, that, that maybe if I've had a knee replacement or a hip replacement on one side, uh, will I need to have it on the other side? Yeah, yes, yeah. so I get that question a lot um, in patients that have, you know, a perfectly good other side or, or one that has yeah. a little bit of nickels. And so, um, so if you have one knee or hip replacement, you won't necessarily need the other side done. It's not a guarantee that both hips or both knees will um, go at the same time or wear out the same way that the first one did. Um, some patients find that they get many years out of their other knee and hip because now their operated leg becomes the good joint and the one that can take a lot of their weight. Um, other patients do progress and, and need a contralateral or the opposite side replaced as well. So um, a recent study I think showed that about one in four patients will need their contralateral or the other side of their hip or knee replaced after their first one. So um, about 25% of patients do, but um, many don't and, and they go for years with just needing one or one or hip or knee. Okay. Um, and, and I guess it's, it's perhaps worth highlighting as well in reference to some of the points we've we've covered uh, previously, that of course, in you know, in in, in some cases, 
uh, it, you know, the, 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 there may be certain instances where uh, where people may be having bilateral procedures, so both sides done at once, uh, yeah. so both, you know, bilateral knee replacement or bilateral hip replacement. Exactly. And there are some, you know, there's pros and cons of both of having them staggered or having them at the same time. And that's definitely a conversation to have with your surgery. Um, you know, certainly having them both at the same time means one hospital visit, mm -hmm. one time under anesthesia. Um, but the recovery is a little harder. And, and so it's not right for every patient. So uh, it does, you know, it's a discussion to have. So if you feel like both of your hips or both of your knees are equally bad, you know, you mm -hmm. can't say which one is much worse, then um, that's a, a good conversation to have because it is an option many times um but many times it makes more sense for staggered so yeah. it's a good thing to keep in mind and, and and staggered would then be that you sort of you have one side and then after a certain period of recovery you yeah do usually after six months or one year you would have the okay. other one done exactly yeah. uh, and of course you know what the all, all of the sort of rough timelines that we've stated are kind of their sort of general averages um, and and without being too specific i guess if you have uh, problems on both sides or if you're having surgery on both sides then generally speaking you may expect things to take a bit longer than than, than the typical average but again that would be quite individual yes exactly and you, you touched also uh, there on it taking longer in, in surgery of course when, when you're doing two sides but how how long does, does a typical hip or knee replacement take for, 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 for a regular one-sided affair? <laughs> yeah, for a regular one-sided hip, um, it depends on surgeon, but it takes about 60 to 90 minutes. So um, not longer than an hour and a half, typically. But then I guess there, that, that will vary potentially a bit with the approach and with anatomy and perhaps other, uh, other conditions from person to person. And generally speaking, there's, there's a fair amount of checks and, uh, and, and things going on just before the operation and indeed a period of recovery. So all, all in all, the, it, may, it may well, you know, it, it, I guess it'll often feel for, for, for loved ones and family who are waiting, it'll feel significantly longer than that because they, you know, right. you'll, you'll, be, you'll be wheeled off to, to where the surgery is taking place and there's some preparation time and things like that. But yeah, for, for the procedure yeah. itself. The actual surgery takes about, yeah, a little, an hour to an hour and a half, exactly. And, and again, if, 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 of course, you're having both sides done, then, then, uh, yeah, then generally speaking, that will, that'll, that'll, that'll take longer. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess a, a related question to having the other side done uh, is how, 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 long, how long does a hip or knee replacement typically last? And, and, and what is the, the, the risk of needing to have it done again or, or revised as it's called? Yes, yes. So um, that's probably, you know, another one of the really common questions patients want to know, you know, after they've undergone surgery, will this last their lifetime? Um, will they have to have another surgery? Um, and so most implants today are designed um, and expected to last at least 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, and a recent study showed that um, about a little more than 10, so about 12% of patients need a revision of their hip after 10 years. So it's a pretty low number. So for most patients, um, we're hoping that the implant lasts their lifetime. Um, obviously that depends on how old they are when they have their surgery um, and a lot of other factors, but we really hope um, that they're designed and expected to last at least 25 years. Yeah, yeah. And, and what, what we could do, because it may be the same study that, that picked this up, uh, but I, not, not too long ago, there was a, an article in the BBC that I think picked up how long hip and knee replacements last. And, and, and I think that they quoted just that figure for 10 years. And even at 25 years, it was still a majority uh, of, of, of cases where, where it was still you know, intact, so to speak, and there would be no need to, 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 re to revise it. And, um, and, and what we'll do is I, we can put the link to that, uh, to that article um, be below, below this video as well. So that oh yeah, that'll be great. Yeah. Super. Well, I think that's that's a pretty uh, yeah I, th I think that's a really good overview for for, for people who are um, thinking about having a hip or knee replacement or getting ready for one or even in the early stages of recovery perhaps to sort of reflect back and and see some of these general points that we've raised. Um, is is there anything else that sort of that sprung to mind or that you'd like to add for you know for, for this session? Um, I don't think so. I, I would say, you know, um, an important thing to do is, is just have questions at hand. So a lot of times I, um, patients come to me with, with written questions and um, oftentimes you get in the office and you're hurrying, especially if you're having remote visits now. Um, so if you have a list of questions, it, it's really nice to have those written down and you can just make sure that you get all of your questions answered. So um, going to your appointment prepared will help. Yeah, super, super. I think I think that's a really good good point. And and you know, as as with anything, and I know people have 
heard this before, but it's worth saying again. There's never, there's no such thing as as a silly question. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what, what, one one question that that uh, that sprung to my mind that 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 I know many people will ask about, and it'd be interesting to hear just your general uh, advice on this. Uh, is about travel and and when people can get back to flying or, or or traveling after surgery. Of course, in current circumstances, that may take some time anyway. Um, yeah. But it, but it might be helpful to hear. Yeah, so there's a lot of factors that go into um, when you can travel. So, you know, a long haul flight to California is very different than a, a train ride up to um, back to Scotland or something. So um, it depends. So for most patients, they will want to won't want to travel until they feel like they can get around the airport or get around the train station um, comfortably. So if you're having if you're on two crutches, it's not going to be very comfortable to carry your things. So before you travel, you want to make sure that you're able to get around, um, getting to and from um, places. You also want to make sure that pain is well controlled and usually that you're not traveling alone. Um, also, you know, in the first six weeks, you want to be cautious because if anything happens and you're very far away from where you had your surgery, mm -hmm. that's not so good. So um, really we look at, um, Again, that kind of six weeks has been a magical number to take a very far away, long haul holiday. Mm -hmm. um, but in other circumstances, if you feel well, um, that can be shortened. So that's definitely a conversation, again, to have with your surgeon. Um, flying does impose a little more risk on blood clots. So we talked a bit about um, how after a surgery, you're at risk for having blood clots anyway. And a flight increases that risk a little more. So if you are taking a flight within the first six weeks, um, it's very important to be taking your medication medication to prevent clots, um, that you're getting up on the flight and walking around every hour or so, um, and maybe wearing your compression stockings if you're still wearing them. Super, super. Well, I hope everyone ha you know, will we'll have a lovely flight when we can, when we can get back, get, get back yes, to those yes. things, or indeed train journeys and, and so on. Um, but that's, that, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Brogan. Um, you're very welcome. Uh, yeah, well, we, we, if, if anyone has any more questions or if this conversation has sparked any ideas uh, or suggestions for a topic for us to cover in an upcoming session, then just let us know uh, and, and we'll dig into it. Um, and until next time, you know, be well, stay safe out there and, and, and keep up the good work, but, but go gently, as, as we said. <laughs> yes, please. Super. And thank you, Morgan. Bye-bye. You're very welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.